right from the very beginning it had nothing to do with national security and everything to do with money. In Hitler, the Illuminati had found a ready-made stooge who could be the face of this autocratic new movement. And when the time came to put together a new secret intelligence service which was going to help protect all the money they had tied up in the German economy, these men also found one was readily available. The Order of the Skull and Bones at Yale University. Discussion of secret societies is something of a minefield because it so easily invites ridicule. It is very difficult for the general public to accept that the super rich leaders of their western world can possibly be as mad and deranged as they actually are. The public, generally speaking, are sensible and level-headed people who have to balance their checkbooks, so they inevitably tend to laugh at stories about Satanists and occult believers. But if you talk to any well-informed historians, they are all aware of the important role which various secret societies have played in human history. And the emblem of the death's head was sported on the caps of the high-ranking Nazi officers from the very beginning. The symbols of these secret societies always seem to play around with some kind of skull and bones motif so that it's abundantly clear what their mission statement is. These people are pirates, willing to commit any crime for big money. And they first became established in America at Yale University in 1833 with General William Huntington Russell and Alfonso Taft. Of course, being a secret society, they made other people curious about them, and in 1867 some undergraduates from a rival campus society broke into their headquarters to see what this skull and bones thing was all about. They reported that inside there were lots of lamps and candles, many dilapidated human skulls lying next to a fool's cap and bells, and it was morbidly dark because the walls were covered in black velvet. Having established a suitably satanic atmosphere, initiation rites were then performed on new members who had to engage in group masturbation and sodomy while they lay in a coffin. US Secretary of State William Max Evarts was a bonesman, as was Treasury Secretary Franklin McVeigh, Chief Justice Simeon Eben Baldwin, and the 27th President of the United States, William Howard Taft. The founder of American football, Walter Camp, came through Skull and Bones, as did the very first chairman of the Federal Reserve, P.A.J., and director of Standard Oil, Percy Rockefeller. Averill Harriman, the son of E.H. Harriman and founder of Harriman Brothers, the largest investment bank in the world, was a bondsman and so were both of the George Bush presidents. During his premiership, John F. Kennedy was surrounded by bondsmen like McGeorge Bundy and David Aitchison, son of Dean Aitchison. Kennedy knew these men refer to each other as brothers under the skin. They swear an oath of secrecy and then ruthlessly vow to help each other's careers in any way they can throughout their lives, even if it means committing murder, in that all of the top police officers are Freemasons. Because if there are ten candidates for a top job, a mason will always select a brother mason for the post. Skull and Bones works the same way, and JFK took this problem so seriously that he even made speeches warning America about the danger of secret societies. What has happened to the US military in the intervening years since it murdered its own commander-in-chief? The answer is that America's armed forces are now completely controlled by the American Mafia. The mob don't even need hitmen anymore. They use United States Marines as assassins. They are, as Sam Giancana said, one organization who keep a low profile while they control the world as a business. And in an effort to prove this is so, in 1998, Pastor Rick Strawcutter videotaped a quite remarkable interview with Kay Pollard Griggs, formerly the wife of Colonel George Griggs, who for many years was the head of NATO. He was also an alcoholic of that well-known kind who was shy and unable to communicate when they are sober, but who then cannot stop talking once they have a drink. 
during the course of a stormy marriage, punctuated by periods of domestic violence, which cost Kay Griggs many black eyes and broken bones, she learned that her husband had been turned into a brutal psychopath as a consequence of his military training, which included induction into what is known as the Pink Triangle, the Cherry Marines. Over the years, far too much has been written about Lee Harvey Oswald. But what is remarkable is that few historians were ever aware that like most Marines who worked in intelligence, he was homosexually recruited and was part of the same-sex club which included Jack Ruby, George Senator and David Ferry. Kay Griggs explains that these selection procedures came into the US military when the cream of the death's head sporting Nazi top brass joined at the American ranks at the war's end. Your name is uh, Catherine Pollard Griggs. Yes. You are the wife of Colonel George Griggs. Yes. 11 years of marriage. Yes. It's true that your husband is uh, and has been the head of special operations under Admiral Kelso, NATO. Yes. And it's true that you were the uh, head of the hospitality committee. Yes. You were the ex a member of the executive board of NATO's Wives Club. Absolutely. And uh, also that your husband's background includes uh, NATO Defense College in Rome, Yes. Princeton class of uh, 1959. Yes. His intelligence career, his spy career began in Vietnam. Yes. And uh, it's also true that it continues under this day. Absolutely under uh, General Wilhelm. And that your uh, husband was the liaison between the White House and President Jamal of Beirut, Lebanon at the time of the bombing of the Marine barracks in uh, Lebanon. Yes. And in fact, your husband was an alcoholic. Absolutely. And probably Credible. is to this day. Absolutely. And uh, during these drunken stupors, uh, he would, so to speak, blab on and tell you everything he knew about the everything. intelligence community. Everything. And this, as shocking as this may sound yeah. to the people who are viewing this, that the United States military is literally run by sexual deviants heavy on the homosexual side. Tr truly. Um, and that the United, in the United States military, People like Jeffrey Dahmer and Kaczynski and McVeigh yes. and Oswald and a host of other people who have a sexual deviant background, uh, primarily homosexual, these individuals are actually sought out by people within the military. The Army. For, uh, the Army for yes. advancement into intelligence type yes. work yes. because they are so easy to control. Yes. And uh, they actually become mind slaves and that the U.S. Yes. military, yes. literally, as, yes. as outrageous as it sounds, is a mind control operation? Yes, totally now, totally now. They've, okay. they've gotten rid of the good folks. Uh, okay. Explain to me a little bit about this, um, the homosexual event here. Well, George, for the first three years of our marriage, was drinking entirely too much. And he, he was trying to let me know about his world. And I'm not judging him. He's, he's a bisexual. Okay. And he, need, he needed help. He needed help, he needed love, still he needed cry. He yeah. still does. Mm -hmm. He really needs help. And the handlers knew that I was changing him. I was taking him away t from this crazy mm -hmm. cult right. that he'd been in all these years. And I mean, we were going to church. He even walked down the aisle one time when Tony Evans preached at Scope. I mean, he was overwhelmed. But he was a little boy when he was... It, it's mind control. Uh, uh, MK Ultra, somebody said. They had a group of men, psychiatrists in New Jersey. I don't know where this place was, but they would go and his, even his roommates in Princeton told me about it. George never, in, intentionally, he never introduced me to any of his friends. So I had to cold call all these people. I got their names and addresses, telephone numbers. I called all these roommates at the Hun School and at Princeton. Mm -hmm. They told me things about George and, you know, holding hands with, you know, with Caddick and other people about being a cheerleader and 
going off and, and so forth. Now, a cheerleader, this is a kind of a, a, a trade name, right? No, he was a, he was a cheerleader for the... Um, the at Princeton? At Princeton. Okay. And here is a guy like that. They put him in the Marine Corps. I don't think that was very nice. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. It was hard. George got into cap and gown, which is the same kind of fraternity. I mean, it's a, an eating club at Princeton. Uh -huh. uh, for intelligence officers. Cap and gown has a lot of intelligence officers and uh, boys who may have been raped. Of course, they'd never talk about it. Right. But um, I know that the initiation is they get very drunk, and even in the Marine Corps they do that. It's called dining in. They have the shell back um, ceremony. They, they do a lot of... Um, homosexual enticement. The boys are, when they, when they come in, when they're new recruits, they strip them nude, they violate their personal parts. Um, there's a lot of that is going on, even now. What about uh, now. Uh, tail hook? Yeah. Is there a connection? Yeah, sure, because this, the, the cream of the crop is, is doing this. They're having group sex parties. And that was a that was a Navy operation too, wasn't it? Yeah, and the, but the Navy and the Marine Corps. Of course not. Maybe we ought to. Maybe we ought to. For those <laughs> that's that, another. That, that tail hook. They don't know anything about tail hook. Was uh, refresh our memories. Old stereotypes about sex crazed sailors have come back to haunt the Navy. Charges of sexual harassment by women who say they were manhandled at a gathering of Navy flyers. It was called the worst case of sexual harassment in the Navy's history. More than 100 Top Gun pilots accused of conduct unbecoming officers and gentlemen. I squatted down to break his, his hold and bit him. Somebody reached between my knees and tried to grab my panties. Dozens of women, including Navy officers, were assaulted at a Las Vegas hotel where an aviator's convention called Tailhook was meeting. Behind the specific assault lies a macho culture which belittles women. Tailhook made public how hostile to women the military was and led to promises of culture change. Denying the dignity and worth of other individuals will not be tolerated. But has the so-called zero tolerance policy worked? Are military women better off today than 20 years ago? The Secretary of the Army is pleading with the public to help find a young soldier who has been missing from Fort Hood in Texas for more than two months. Investigators suspect foul play in the disappearance of Private First Class Vanessa Guillen, who had recently told family she'd been sexually harassed on the base. Women are second class citizens, and whether they can fly a jet or not, let's party and have at it. And that's really how it all kind of played out. It all played out on the hotel's third floor, where convention after parties turned ugly. Drunken aviators roamed the halls, exposing their genitals and attacking unsuspecting Navy and civilian women. When Lieutenant Coughlin entered this corridor, packed with partiers, a crowd of male aviators surrounded her and pounced. People were actually closing in and um, trying to pull my clothes off, um, I got knocked to the floor, and I kicked, and I punched, and I actually bit somebody who was reaching down my blouse. She eventually escaped and later told her boss, Admiral John Snyder, about the incident. He promised to report it. Coughlin remembers him saying something else, something Snyder denies. He told me, that's what you get when you go down a hallway full of drunk aviators. Coughlin's media appearances transformed Tailhook from a Navy embarrassment to a national scandal. 